Okay, lovely. <coughs> well, I'll try and keep this to, uh, to 20 minutes or so, so that we can get to uh, cookies and biscuits. Um, I always seem to get these shifts just before breaks or lunch, so uh, it's a bit of a graveyard, I'm afraid. Uh, first and foremost, uh, apologies for the um, uh, latest sort of change in speaker. Uh, my colleague uh, Gary McDowell was due to actually present this, um, but unfortunately a family emergency has kept him away, so I will do my best to present his slides, um, but apologies in advance for any oversights, omissions, or any questions that I am unable to answer on his behalf. So um, essentially, we'll just have a look at a few things, uh, a little bit about who we are, uh, a little bit about the evolution of the internet, um, and uh, how some of the uh, methods for combating infringements have, have changed and evolved. Um, actually, quite a few new uh, tools that have been made available just over the past couple of years. Um, maybe a quick case study, um, and then uh, any questions, or indeed we break for coffee, and you grab myself or my colleague um, over a cup of tea. So um, a little bit about Nets Names. Um, so this is who we are. Um, we were founded almost 20 years ago. Uh, very much back then it was a domain name uh, provider, um, was our main focus. But certainly over the past five to sort of eight years, we've been uh, branching very heavily into the brand protection space. Um, so we have a team uh, based in Cambridge um, of analysts who basically run that sort of forensic intelligence unit of our business, uh, identifying infringing activity online, or should I say suitably uh, important infringing activity online. Um, you can certainly find a, uh, an immense volume of infringements, um, but it's actually going after those high value targets. Um, as I was saying to Duncan earlier, it's not the one pair of shoes at customs, um, it's, you know, it's the container loads uh, and the tens of thousands of units that are made to order um, that are the targets we really want to go after. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've offices uh, around the world, um, and most recently uh, are setting up in Australia, Singapore and India, uh, about 400 uh, plus employees scattered around those offices. So, um, uh, yeah, and actually final thing to mention here is that we're currently covering about 39 languages across the organisation. Um, that's quite important later on when we look at some of the actual enforcement tools that we have. Most of those languages uh, are actually covered out of that Cambridge unit that I mentioned. Um, so that really enables us to connect through to registries, registrars and marketplaces around the world. So evolution of the internet, I mean this is um, I suppose uh, uh, something that you will be very very familiar with um, but uh, you know, we started off way back when in 1990 with domain names coming out, um, we all remember the, the, uh, the dot com bubble, um, various things such as eBay and Craigslist uh, joined us in the mid 90s and then through we go to the Alibaba group um, in uh, almost the early noughties and so it continues. Pirate Bay, our good friends there um, in, uh, in, in 2003, Taobao, Facebook, Facebook's actually only just over a decade old, it's amazing isn't it? Um, and Instagram and then most recently the new GTLD developments which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, with all the not just dot brands that you can have, uh, such as dot HSBC, for example, uh, but all the various uh, geographic extensions like dot London, dot Paris, dot NYC, um, the uh, verticals, dot uh, luxury uh, being one, dot um, uh, bank, um, there's even dot ninja um, if you uh, <laughs> feel like going a, a little bit down that route. Um, so, anyway, as, as that, the digital channels have evolved, um, and as consumers have evolved their, their purchasing patterns and the way of interacting with brand owners, all of those opportunities, the flip side to that coin is also there's a whole new area of risk um, that's presented to brand owners. So it's no longer just a case of um, a, a domain name infringement being uh, the, the main sort of avenue uh, that an infringer will use to get access with consumers. They can now use a whole range of, of other channels to get access to them. Um, and increasingly we're seeing the use of blended attacks. Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, <clears throat> someone trying to set up a group on social media, for example, uh, offering voucher codes, discount codes, and through that social media page, redirecting you to a link on a website which um, has hidden content to anyone coming uh, to that page other than through that link. So if you just went to that web page, you'd see it not resolving. But if you come to it via the social media channel and that group, then you get to a fictitious page which is showing you a discount code and voucher. 
Now that could be used for online purchase, that could be used for offline purchase. Um, and very often with, with many of our customers like uh, Inditext, uh, who owns Zara, uh, for example, um, they have a big problem with people just turning up with seemingly legitimate voucher codes in shops, um, but obviously they're not being uh, able to redeem them at the store, uh, the, at the checkout point. Um, so obviously that then becomes a very frustrated consumer who doesn't blame themselves, they obviously blame the store for uh, being inept um, and unable to find that particular voucher code. So it's quite interesting how they're using both online and offline, but also just pure play digital attacks as well. Um, but I uh, can't quite remember how many uh, things that uh, Gary's put in here. He's, he, he does like the sort of the building slide. Um, but, uh, but it's not all bad. Uh, digital actually can be quite a good source of intelligence as well. And that's one of the happy byproducts that we find with a lot of our customers as well, um, is that actually there, there's a number of examples where actually people have monitored um, uh, infringer activity. Um, uh, Supergroup, for example, have noticed um, not necessarily infringers, but grey market sales going up in certain countries, um, and then use that as part of the decision-making process about which countries to then officially uh, move into. Um, because actually, you know, they can see that there is a growing demand and a market for their, their goods in a certain area, so therefore they're using that as part of their expansion strategy or intelligence to support those decisions. Um, Breaking Bad uh, very publicly said that one of the reasons why they were such a, a phenomenal global success was actually due to the fact that um, uh, their series, their first series was pirated so heavily. And without that, without that proof um, that there was an audience out there that wanted to see this series, um, they would have not got the funding uh, from the studios for the second and third and uh, well, I'm, I'm not gone past that yet, so I still haven't seen the end. So if anyone has, don't tell me. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, in, in France, I believe the, the Jimmy Fallon show is now shown on TV, um, and that is a direct result of uh, intelligence that came out of people downloading and streaming that free pirate bay. So um, I'm not condoning what they do by any stretch of imaginations. All I'm just saying is that actually sometimes there is some intelligence that we can gather uh, from these infringers at the same point in time as... Uh, trying to stop them or disrupt them. So historically, um, there's been essentially quite, quite few um, options that we've, we've had um, as uh, brand owners or working for brand owners to, to help them protect themselves online. Um, generally, we were talking about the main name monitoring being the main uh, recourse and the main, the main method. Um, and that was really ever focused around the, um, the GTLD space. So there's 22 uh, generic top-level domains, com, net, org, info, biz, so on and so forth. Um, and they were quite easy to monitor and quite easy to capture data from. Um, country codes, so the 240-plus country codes, .uk, .fr, and .de, etc., were much more complex and actually still remain very complex sometimes to get information from um, because there is no kind of uniform structure to how and even if they have to deliver what we call who is information, so who actually owns the domain names that have been registered. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a much more complex area to figure out actually if there's been an infringement, and if so, who that infringer actually is. Limitations to that, um, as we've seen with um, uh, you know, the, the expansion of the digital channels and the expansion to how consumers are trying to interact with brands, is that, oh, it's um, a little bit low down here, but just looking at a domain name infringement wouldn't actually detect uh, things such as um, a generic website. Um, so, you know, uh, Stuart.com, uh, I could then set up a page after that looking at um, uh, Gucci. Um, the domain name itself is Stuart.com, that's not infringing to Gucci, so it's the content that's delivered on that page. Uh, likewise, I could register a domain name that might be infringing today, but I might choose not to actually activate it and publish any content on there for another six months, 12 months, etc. Um, so there's that potential infringement, but it's not necessarily being used in a way of bad faith. So therefore we have to keep tracking it until such point in time as actually, um, it, you know, it, it, it becomes a, an active concern for us. Um, there's various other ways as well. Um, for example, <coughs> logos um, being used on page. Um, you know, it's something we see a lot um, in particular marketplaces where people will offer um, a product such as, for example, printer cartridges, um, and they will say that it's just, you know, it's a reconditioned or it's a, it's a you know, refurbed 
um, or it's uh, compatible with various printers, um, but then actually within the actual image of the listing, they might well put a Canon or an HP logo, for example, on there to give it an air of authenticity, um, to almost make it appear as if it's an HP product, even though the brand owner is not noted at all in any of the textual content of either the listing or the listing description or the website, etc. Okay. Um, the logo we'll kind of touch on a little bit later on. It's one of those things that actually, um, when we talk about, when we talk about consumer confusion, and we're not lawyers, we're not a law firm, um, essentially we're probably techie geeks, um, for want of another word, um, but um, when we look at actually what is most likely to, consume, uh, to confuse a consumer, we think the logo plays an important part in that, um, because it's a very obvious um, a visual um, uh, image that consumers will recognise. <coughs> You know, if you see uh, you know, the Zara logo, or if you see uh, the Golden Arches, or whatever the, the logo is, it's very, very distinctive, and it, and it does give that uh, sort of additional level of authenticity. So, some new modern techniques, and you are probably all very well uh, aware of these, um, um, so I, I'm not going to uh, uh, you know, uh, teach you how to, to, to suck eggs, um, but Trademark Clearinghouse, uh, or TMCH, because uh, we like um, an abbreviation, um, has uh, launched um, uh, as part of the new GTLD program. Um, it's a deterrent, not a protection measure. Uh, measure. So the uh, 900 or so new GTLDs that are expected to be launched, um, and I think we're about halfway through that program now, so we've got another three, 400 to go in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, all of them um, have an obligation to provide consistent data in a consistent <coughs> format, but also to actually check registrations during their first 90 days against the trademark clearinghouse. So if you have a record of trademark registered in this database, you are able to participate in a prior rights phase to try and defensively register your, uh, your brand. If that TLD is relevant to you, um, you know, I, I would certainly see some of those old defensive registration strategies where uh, people would try and protect their key brand in every single extension is simply no longer viable uh, when we have so many to choose from. So you have to be very, very selective now. Um, but Trademark Clearinghouse actually does afford you some form of protection. So there's about 34,000 uh, trademarks registered at the moment in that database. Um, there's been about 128,000 domains registered which pertain back to those <coughs> Trademark Clearinghouse records. So about four for every uh, Trademark Clearinghouse record. But what's interesting is that there's been over a million notifications of registered rights to potential registrants of domains. So I might have gone online and said, I want to register uh, you know, Nike.London. Um, and what I am given is a, a notice from the .London registry that says, you do realize that this is someone's trademark rights, correct? So I'm not going to stop you from registering it. But if you do register it, you're registering it in the knowledge that there are registered rights and that you're agreeing not to abuse those rights or infringe those rights in any way. Um, and what we're seeing is actually, uh, that's actually, uh, it, it, what's the right word? Uh, not encouraging, the opposite. <laughs> uh, discouraging. discouraging, there we go. Um, uh, a, a number of, of people from actually going forward and proceeding with their registration. So on average, for every trademark clearinghouse record, there's about 25 registrations which are started but are not completed. So actually that, that's, in my mind, quite a good thing um, because you know people um, are, are becoming much more familiar with IP rights um, and and actually what they should and shouldn't be doing, and are backing away from that and going after different uh, different uh, alternatives. Um, unfortunately, it's only available on the new GTLDs. It's not something that covers existing um, domains, be they the country code or the existing .com, net, or etc. Uh, donuts, uh, right side registry, um, you know, these are two of the big operators of these new GTLDs. Uh, donuts is probably going to manage 300 or so um, of the extensions. Um, and uh, they've essentially offered certain products which enable you to block, defensively block. So for a few thousand dollars, you can block um, uh, Nike, for example, as a string. And what that will mean is no one will be able to register Nike dot, whatever the domain name is, under all of their 300 uh, TLD. Uh, you then have the right, uh, if you want to at a later stage, to then activate that and use it yourself. But if not, it's a pure play defensive measure. But essentially, you're blocking 300 potential domains 
for the price of a couple of thousand dollars. Unfortunately, um, it's only available um, on Donuts uh, right side registry. Um, it's not available on all of the TLDs that are out there. Um, and then you have companies like us that do brand protection solutions. Um, and there are a number of companies in this space. We do not look at legal enforcement. We look at technical uh, measures that we can use to try and disrupt infringer behavior um, and the visibility of, inf uh, of, 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 of those infringers' activities to your end consumers. What does that really mean? Okay, uh, well, very quickly, we monitor. So we look across a whole range of various digital channels and sources. That gives you a problem in some regard because it can throw up millions of and millions of results. Um, so the evaluation or filtering process then becomes extremely important. Um, we heavily use technology to do that. Um, so uh, in one case, for example, we detected over 2 million references here. Um, the technology whittled that down to the top 30,000 um, based upon customer specific, brand specific variables. Um, the analysts that I mentioned earlier then cut that again and that got us down to 15,000. So we've gone from 2 million to 15,000, what we would deem as high value targets. Um, and that's what we then went enforced against. Um, and this was a marketplace solution, so we're looking at various listings at all the, the weird and wonderful marketplaces around the world. Um, but that filtering process um, is extremely important. If you, if you just switched on this, then you'd be inundated and swamped. Um, so the, 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 the technology there can actually act as, uh, uh, as a tool that enables you to handle that data and then also gives you some increased scale um, to some of your enforcement measures. Actions and reporting, um, so again, that's, that's them stepping through those high value targets and it's deciding actually what is the quickest, easiest um, way of, of achieving a desired outcome, be that reducing the, uh, the visibility, be that removing the links, be that uh, the indexing from search engines, and we'll touch on a few of these in a second, um, and then various uh, investigations and countermeasures at the other end. Uh, we work with a number of customers where we actually provide digital intelligence to then support offline investigation and enforcement and litigation. Um, so, I'm just going to whiz through a few of these because I know we're getting close to uh, coffee time. Um, various things that we, we, we tend to do for our customers is uh, go after domain name deactivations uh, with the various registries and registrars. And again, this is not a legal method, but this is just basically knowing what the various terms and conditions are at all the various registrars and the various registries around the world and pointing out where a domain name is being used in breach of those terms and conditions um, and using that to actually try and get the domain name itself suspended at the registry level. Uh, we go to ISPs and go after URL deactivation. So again, same way we understand the T's and C's at the registrars and registries, it's also about understanding who the ISPs are out there and what they allow their customers to do and not to do and pointing out those type of infringements. And then also to the domain owner. Um, not every domain owner is actually uh, meaningly uh, going after or infringing. Uh, and sometimes it's just a case of actually pointing out what they're doing right or wrong. Um, especially if you've got, for example, fan sites, you know, you don't want to disrupt that. Um, but actually maybe you want to just have a softer approach where they're removing certain content from or certain images from, from uh, certain pages on their website, etc. DMCA, I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, but that's something that we use uh, heavily with, with Google to get um, uh, results delisted, so removed from search engine uh, ranking and visibility. So again, it removes that visibility or tries to impact that visibility um, to the end consumer. Uh, and then places like eBay, eBay is one, uh, as I said, that there's 500 plus marketplaces that we monitor across around the world. Um, each of them have their own unique Vero process, in another way. You know, some are... <laughs> Some are more open to it than others, uh, put it that way. Um, this is where the language comes into it. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we have great success in uh, a lot of the Asian uh, registrars and registries and marketplaces is because actually we can pick up the phone and we can speak to them in their native language um, and uh, build a relationship over time. And to a large extent, actually, the, the effectiveness of what we're asking them to do is really down to a bit of social engineering. <coughs> 
Um, you know, there are rules and regulations, but sometimes they're a little bit gray. Um, and it's actually how well they know us and how much they trust us that is one of the deciding factors in, uh, in them actually going forward and either challenging the, uh, the information or issuing a suspension notice to the registrant. Uh, logos, I will skip over this. Um, I, I mentioned earlier how important it was. Um, there is some uh, extremely good technology that we use um, to, uh, to look for logos. Um, and then a little note here, which is where it's complementary, not contradictory to, uh, to, to IP uh, enforcement uh, processes that most of you will be doing with your customers. Um, again, we see ourselves as, as providing intelligence um, about what's going on on the wider uh, digital channels. Uh, UDRP and URS remain extremely important measures to use. Um, and what we find is actually uh, through doing a program or even just a one-time project, uh, which is what a number of customers do, if they, they feel they have enough justification for an ongoing program of work, then we can look at a one-time project doing an audit and understanding what that actual landscape looks like to end up help driving UDRPs and URSs as well uh, to go and uh, increase that kind of caseload um, uh, for yourselves. Um, and then finally, something to note about is there's many safe havens out there. Um, you know, you can chase a domain name, uh, you can chase a URL, uh, but once it goes to some of the countries, um, Russia being one, for example, um, then our remit really kind of stops. We know that once it goes to an ISP there, it becomes extremely difficult for us to use technical measures to resolve the issue, and then obviously legal becomes um, the, the default uh, course of action there. I've got a funny story about chat from Worldplay later on, if anyone wants to hear it. Um, so, anyway, uh, this is just a, another way of looking at the process flow that I mentioned earlier. Um, detect, analyze, take down, look at the various different recovery uh, or suspension and disruption methods. Um, but most importantly, we will end up here with uh, more cases than, um, uh, than we would generally do if we were just looking at domain name infringements alone. Um, a French luxury brand, um, I realized I'm almost approaching my time, so I will rattle through this. Um, I can't say who this is, but um, it's one of the big uh, French uh, companies um, that uh, you would all be very, very familiar with. Um, so in the past, well, 11 months, I suppose, so January to November um, 2014, uh, we have actually enforced <coughs> on 1,500 um, uh, infringing domain names for them. Um, actually, this started out at a list of about 9,000, which we then whittled down to them to say, well, actually, the, the other kind of 7,500 are not necessarily cases that we would, we would advise you going after, because we're talking onesie twosies, um, you know, small individuals, not getting very much traffic to those sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so go after these ones, which are much higher value targets. Um, and we used a range of those methods, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, and probably maybe about 10% of these or so, uh, actually probably under 10%, uh, ended up being suitable for, for UDRP and URS. Um, but uh, in a vast majority of the cases, we've got the content removed uh, or the domain name deactivated at a registry and a registrar level. Um, one of the things we also do for that customer is look at marketplaces. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, so uh, in that same 11 month period, we enforced on 20, almost 23,000 uh, listings across various marketplaces around the world. Um, and again, this is not someone selling one pair of shoes or, or one scarf. This is people who are selling hundreds of items and or are actually offering made to order uh, capabilities as well. Um, we ignore the kind of value for the time being. Uh, this can be very highly skewed if someone says, for example, I can produce a billion items, um, then obviously it, it kind of throws it out a little bit. What we'll be doing with the customer next year, well this year, is actually putting in caps uh, based upon their average unit production, you know, number of units per container or per pallet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of just the next couple of slides touch on a little bit more the some of the ways that this customer has used the intelligence in a slightly different approach. So here we're looking at um, by marketplace that we've been monitoring across. Um, and you can see, well, you probably can't see actually because it's far too small. Um, so trust me, take my word. Um, um, but uh, 
some of the variance here is, is dramatic. So, you know, uh, sites like eBay, uh, the actual volume has been very low, uh, but that's not unexpected. Um, eBay tends to be more of a grey market um, issue rather than a counterfeit issue, um, certainly for this customer. Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, marketplaces like 1688, uh, Taobao, um, essentially a Alibaba group, um, um, uh, seem to be very, very high, which is again where we would kind of expect that to be. Um, the customers actually use this and also this information where we've been looking at it by, by product or by brand, by, by kind of uh, uh, item that's being sold. So the main issue seems to be brag, uh, bags of brand one, uh, so for their, their leading brand basically. Um, and they've, they've used this information to actually then go and uh, reach an agreement with Alibaba Group to actually try and suppress listings before they become publicly launched. So we know where the big threats are and we know what the big threat items are. So how can we actually then, or well, the customer did this, go and actually have that conversation with some of these big auction houses to say, what can we do to take this a bit further upstream? And our role then becomes one of compliance. It becomes one of policing what should and should not be. Uh, available and visible to the consumer. So it's a slightly different, rather than just finding the bad stuff and, uh, and, and, and taking them down, um, it's, it's now policing an agreement that they've made with the third party. Uh, final uh, piece of intelligence to kind of share with you on this was actually by then looking at sellers. Uh, so this is where, these are marketplace sellers, um, but what we would do here is actually look at, find these are the people that are, that, are, uh, that, are, that are causing us the maximum kind of concern and issue and this is how many uh, you know, items, etc. Um, we often find that these people are also some of the higher value targets when we look at websites, URLs, domain names. So they're actually attacking across multiple channels and that essentially that network we then identify can actually form the case of, of a wider um, uh, you know, abuse case or litigation, etc. where you can tie that back to an individual or a particular country, uh, company and go after the whole, the whole lot. Um, how do we know we're doing? We're working. Well, I suppose PyPy, the problem is getting worse. Um, I offer the problem is getting better. Um, but again, this is fundamentally how we judge whether or not the solution or the program is working. Uh, what we tend to see and what we expect to see is that actually your problem diminishes on those key marketplaces. Yes, they may be shifted onto secondary marketplaces and tertiary marketplaces, and that is something to be aware of. But again, if that's not where your consumers are, then what you're doing is you're making yourself a harder target. You're causing that increased disruption. Um, our knowledge of most of these infringers is that actually they have five or six horses in their stable. Um, and you know, if you try and make yourself that hard target, they'll just flip all their actions onto uh, on their focus onto some of those other horses in their stable. Um, so they won't just go after one particular fashion brand um, or company in a vertical. They'll have multiple targets there. Um, and um, I, I think that's, um, oh no, don't, no, sorry, um, forgot about those. Um, this is just a bit of a context really, I suppose. So, so when we're dealing with customers, we look at area, all of these kind of areas which we think are important, making sure that they've got a good presence um, that it's protected properly uh, and that through that they're achieving their online objectives. Um, so what we've been talking about so far is, is this kind of section here. Um, there's a whole range of other things that we would look at as well. Um, security, uh, you know, the DNS, how it's being used, how it's not being used, are there you know, security threats there, etc. as well, uh, which we kind of combine into this. Um, so it's just, I suppose, a small part of a much broader set of uh, challenges for more of the, the, you know, the communications and the brand and the marketing teams when they're looking at actually achieving those, those digital objectives. Um, and that's it. Um, so uh, I thank Gary for putting the slides together. Um, if you do have any questions, um, probably now is not the time because I've run over. Um, so unless, uh, unless we have. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Questions or cookies? Your, your choice. <laughs> your <laughs> choice. <laughs> I was just going to say one thing, which is that we found at our firm that um, Alibaba have quite cleverly created this massive online legitimate um, store called Tmail. Yes. And one of the things they're doing is using that as a bit of a stick or carrot, I don't know how which way you describe it, <laughs> um, to basically encourage brands 
to sign up to T-Mail to sell their stuff legit legitimately, and then things are magically disappearing, counterfeit stuff is magically disappearing from Alibaba. So I just wonder yes. if that was maybe also a good strategy to kind of be a bit clever. As it well. is absolutely a strategy. Um, uh, you know, T-Mail is, or T-Mail, uh, right. either or, um, is, um, uh, from a business perspective, it makes sense to set yourself up there as a yeah. brand owner, yeah. um, because it does then act as a shop front into into a, a, a very key important market. Yeah. Funnily enough, what we have seen from I would say a good half of our customers yeah. is that actually that did not help them at all. Oh, right. okay. um, and uh, you know they, they pay for that that store. Yeah. Um, they get an account management service, um, which. Um, uh, just, 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 just meant nothing. Um, essentially, they were just being, um, you know, fed another data feed of. Oh, by the way, we found this. But there, there have been some cases where actually it's been uh, it's been beneficial, and useful for them. Mm. Um, I suppose it's quite arbitrary. Um, that's mm. that's the challenge, um, and that's the the challenge with Alibaba Group is that each of those areas are part of the group, but they're completely run and managed separately. Oh, I um, you know, I. I been in meetings where we've had executives from Alibaba Group, and executives from Taobao, um, absolutely disagreeing with each other about how to treat with counter counterfeit items, um, to the point where the Taobao think it's actually just quite entrepreneurial and innovative. Um, Alibaba Group think no, this is this is wrong, and you know we're <laughs> we're flated on the New York Stock Exchange. You know we need to have better rules and regulations. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's it's a and they will openly admit it's a huge challenge for them. It's it's, it's such a Goliath beast yeah. um, that um, you know uh, enforcing set rules and, and protocol um, is yeah it, it's a massive challenge. But by all means, you know it can't hurt. No. Um, you know, so it's it's one more tool uh, you know that we can leverage. eBay got a beating in court. A few years back in, 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 pa in Paris, yeah. um, I think started by the likes of LVMH and Hermes. Are you seeing the same thing for these Chinese um, selling platforms such as Alibaba and all that? See, we've not yet seen, of? you know, we're not yet seen. I think what we've actually seen is a bit of a different approach. Uh, Louis Vuitton um, is, is quite well known for the fact that they've done, uh, you know, a, an approach to, uh, to Taobao and reached an accord about actually, again, how they can try and uh, work closer together. Um, okay. So I think we're seeing people try and work with them. As opposed to litigate. Correct, correct, a little bit. But how, how much patience people will have with that, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I certainly know that um, whilst we achieve very good success rates on those Asian marketplaces, um, that's not consistent throughout the, the industry. Um, so it is a challenge, a major challenge. Um, so time will tell. Any other questions at all? Fabulous. Thank You're you. most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so um, that concludes the first part of the session. Uh, we're going to